Welcome back, everybody. So this afternoon we have uh, a first session on a more uh, formal methods approach to privacy uh, with free talks, and then we will have uh, the panel, as mentioned, uh, about how to set uh, the privacy parameter. So the first talk uh, in the first session is uh, by David Sands on uh, some uh, lesson we learn uh, by formal modeling information. Thank you very much, Marco, uh, and thanks to the organisers for the, uh, the uh, invitation and the opportunity to escape Sweden for a, a week or so uh, while winter is still in, in full swing. So I've been working with information flow in various forms for quite a long time. Information flow is interesting for many reasons, but uh, I think the most interesting ones relate to security and privacy. Because in security and privacy, we fundamentally care about what happens to our information and how it flows through systems. And indeed, when it comes to privacy and differential privacy, we're interested in not only how it flows, but in what quantities, in a certain sense, does it flow. Now, I'm coming from a background in programming languages and formal semantics. So I'm interested in modeling things in a precise way uh, and it turns out that this is a good match for understanding information flow properties because information flow properties are tremendously subtle. There are many things that seem to go wrong uh, in both formalizing them and building systems which fulfill certain information flow-based goals. So what I'm going to do today is reflect a little bit upon some of the things that I've learned um, relating to information flow. And I'm going to do so through uh, an example relating to a system for enforcing differential privacy, which is one of the few things that I've done in the direction specifically of differential privacy. So when you think about differential privacy, maybe you think about something like this. It's some clever probabilistic mechanism which, where you feed in a bit of sensitive data and out pops some data which you're willing to release. And there's lots of complex stuff that can go on inside one of these mechanisms. Um, but I'm interested in a slightly bigger picture. I'm interested in, in how we put one of these little clever mechanisms in some context. So some context is going to be some bigger thing. It maybe involves some local storage of data. It maybe involves some other stuff in which the mechanism is embedded, other kinds of computation that are not specifically uh, related to the mechanism, but to do with the reformatting, the processing of data, uh, the uh, shuffling it around, getting it in the right shape. And in fact, things are not necessarily as simple as this. Typically, when we have a system, we have some other data in the system. There isn't just the sensitive data and nothing else. There's often other data which is not sensitive, which we maybe can use freely. And um, one of the ways in which we use that data freely is, for example, we might want to store the results uh, of um, previous computations. Now, we look at a bit about the green stuff here. The green stuff is the way we take building blocks, these mechanisms, and plug them together in various ways to build our system. And so we may be doing that in some principled way, hopefully. Um, and we may indeed, as I mentioned, have some kind of feedback in this loop. This is an interactive or a, a system which runs over time. It's not just a simple function with a single input and a single output. It has an iterative, uh, ongoing behavior. And that behavior may involve various forms of feedback. And in fact, one of the most obvious forms of feedback in a system enforcing differential privacy is that one of the pieces of typically public data is the budget, which is affected by the computation in various ways. So I would say that if we take a slightly bigger view of differential privacy, we're looking at a system which is potentially a little bit more complex than the idealized models, and one in which there are a number of potentially interesting and potentially problematic information flows that we have to understand. So I want to tell you a little bit by way of illustrating some more general 
observations. Uh, a little bit about a differential privacy mechanism, uh, which was by and large invented by my former student, Hamid. So Hamid came up with this idea, completely independent of me, of pretty much anybody, I would say, uh, uh, as, a, as a master's student. He implemented a system for dynamically enforcing differential privacy, rather much in the style of the pink system of McSherry. I'll say a few words about that shortly. Uh, but doing something very unusual, namely replacing the idea of a global budget for the database with a per-user budget. Now, my first reaction to this is that can't possibly work. Because if it's a per-user budget, then somehow that's going to be influenced by the data of the user. And if your budget is influenced by the data of the user, that just doesn't feel quite right. That's the sort of thing when you look at the literature, everybody always avoids. I mean, think local sensitivity. Why don't you use local sensitivity? Well, because the noise is specific to the data. So if you use that noise, you potentially reveal something about the data. So this sounded terribly wrong to me. But at the same time, for Hamid, this was terribly obvious. It's obvious that this would, 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 would work, would not be a problem. So he's a rather fit looking chap, so we couldn't really take it outside. So I think the best way I thought to resolve this would be to try and build a formal model of what he was trying to do. In that way, I could understand it better. And we together could maybe prove that it, it does indeed satisfy the differential privacy property that, we, that he certainly expected it to and I certainly was very um, dubious about. So let me tell you a little bit about PINK before I get into a little bit more detail about this system. Was there a question there, oh, sir? Just a quick clarification. So is user here a data subject or data analyst? Uh, a data subject is the user in this, uh, in this context. Yes, a very, a very natural question indeed. Sorry for the uh, lack of clarity. Per user as in data subject. OK, so let me tell you about PINK. PINK was one of the first systems which attempted to make the construction of somewhat new differential private algorithms idiot-proof in the privacy sense. That is to say, you're given a bunch of building blocks, a bunch of basic differentially private mechanisms, and you can program with them, but the programming model keeps track of important security-related features. In particular, when you transform data, you really need to know what the sensitivity of the resulting database is, because that is a multiplier for the privacy cost when you apply a basic epsilon query to that piece of data. So what PINK actually provides you with is an API. It's an interface to a, a protected implementation. So there's data in the system, namely a global privacy budget, which is assigned to the data. And for every intermediate table that's constructed from the initial data, the system automatically keeps track of the sensitivity, or stability as I think McSherry called it in this context, of the intermediate tables. So that's roughly the way it works. And the bookkeeping is to make sure that you, in, you use the sensitivity to calculate the appropriate privacy cost of a given query. And if there isn't enough budget left, the analyst can't make a mistake. The system just said, says, no, sorry. Sorry, Dave, I can't do that. OK, so that's pink. So the, the motivation for moving to a personalized budget, personalized from the data subject's point of view, can be, can be thought of in the following way, and you may be able to come up with other possible motivations, but here's, here are the ones that we were thinking about. So firstly, if you don't plan the use of your budget in a smart way, you can end up being extremely wasteful in pink. And sometimes it's not always easy to plan in advance how you're going to use your budget. For example, if you were to divide up your budget between different analysts who are in some sense independent, then it may not be necessarily very easy to make a plan, a global plan, for coordinating the potentially overlapping queries 
of two different parties in order to ensure the best possible use of your budget. So in this example, let's imagine that I have a big data set and I'm interested in doing a particular survey of people with AB negative blood, blood type AB negative, 0.6% of the population. Now, as far as pink is concerned, the size of the population is really not, doesn't come into play. There's a global budget. If I analyze the hell out of the, this group of AB negative subjects, my global budget will be gone. So that when analyst number two comes along on Tuesday and says, oh yeah, how did the, how did the AB negative uh, survey go? Oh yeah, great, got some great, great stats on that one. Um, yeah, right, well today I'm, I'm gonna do some study over all adults in this fantastic data set. Now, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, buddy. I've used up all the budget. I used up all the budget on 0.6% of the population. That's not great. Another scenario where a global budget is problematic is where you have continuous data. You have data, you have a database which is, which is not static. Okay, so at some point in time, that's, this is the data we've got, we can analyze it a bit. But as time goes on, some records disappear, some new records come in. If we have a global budget, we would have to somehow divide up into epochs. We couldn't analyze the data continuously. We'd have to sort of say, okay, this is the 2000, 2010 census, this is the 2020, and for all intents and purposes, we view these as separate things. So we couldn't do this continuously over time. So both of these issues are motivation for having a personalized budget. But if you have a personalized budget, you can focus, if we're only doing survey on, on individuals with a particular characteristic, they're the only ones whose privacy potentially is affected. Now, you may be thinking that sounds fishy. That's good. I, always, I also think this sounds very fishy, which is why it's extremely important if you have a system like this that smells a bit fishy, to really work out what it's doing. What kind of properties are you really uh, satisfying? Okay, so I'll get into that into a moment. So let me just tell you about personalized differential privacy. So this was the definition of differential privacy in which individuals have their own personal epsilon. Interestingly, uh, within a month of us uh, publishing, there was another paper using the same concept of personalized differential privacy with exactly the same definition. That was really cool. And we had no, uh, no knowledge of each other's work. Uh, the, the enforcement mechanisms are entirely different. So that was where the similarity ended. So personalized differential privacy is a genuine generalization of differential privacy in which each individual has their own personal epsilon. Now I'm not particularly interested in allowing individuals to set their own epsilons. That's not the goal here. This is really as a, a means to do a more fine-grained accounting of the budget. So for present purposes, you can imagine everybody starts with the same epsilon. And at the top level, that's going to imply regular epsilon differential privacy. But the ability to have fine-grained uh, budgets will give us the ability to account for the budget in a more fine-grained way. So we can show then that the basic composition principles that McSherry used to build his system also hold in a more generalized form in the individual case. That's great. We have the same building blocks. Uh, but what we do which is different is implement personalized differential privacy by tracking the exact provenance of every record in every intermediate table that we construct. So any table that we construct along the way, however we do it, we will know for every record in that table, which individuals was that record built from. So what we get then is an extremely fine-grained notion of sensitivity. We know exactly what the dependencies are and their multiplicities, most importantly. And we can use that to know how much and how many times we should deduct an epsilon from the individual budgets of the participants in a query.
So if we visualize that with a picture. Can I ask a question back on that slide? Yeah. When you implement number one, what's the definition of neighboring databases? Uh, so we're just using um, unbounded differential privacy. Regular differential privacy. Epsilon, uh, two neighboring databases if you add or remove a given record. Um, what's the universe from which those databases are selected? It's not, it's not specified. These are, these are just some relational database tables in the implementation. When I swap a person in and out, what epsilon comes with that person? So there is some way of uniquely identifying the epsilon for a given record. So you could imagine that every record maybe carries some I identifier that so allows you to. The population from which the databases are drawn, every entity has its own epsilon already assigned. Yeah, in a sense, it's kind of, kind of set at a meta level. Okay. Yeah. So here's a little table um, with a bunch of people. Uh, and there's some initial budget, and as I say, let's just put a, well, the same budget on every one. I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in it. exotic guarantees. I'm just going to guarantee one differential privacy in this case. We may do some computation on this table. Select all the ages of the adults. All the adult ages, that's a transformation on the table. That generates an intermediate table. What do you notice about the intermediate table? Well, there's some colors on it. Those colors are representing the provenance that is to say that this record is derived from Mary, uh, and this one is derived from Bob. So now when we perform a query on this, some um, primitive differential private query that the system provides us with from its toolbox, we can calculate, say, the average. But we can also update the budget, and we do so by looking at the provenance of the tables and the multiplicities of those prov provenances and deducting correspondingly from the personal budgets. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there is a catch. You see, systems for differential privacy, they don't measure privacy. They enforce privacy. And there's an important difference there. Because when you enforce privacy, you sometimes have to, in some way, say no. And that decision is an important carrier of information. You can't ignore it. So if you model a system like this as one which doesn't enforce privacy but just measures it, then things become a lot easier. But they, in some sense, become unrealistic because that's not what we want to do, typically. We do want to enforce an a priori bound on our privacy. OK, so the catch is, in pink, if you run out of the global budget, you deny the query, you throw an exception, and that's OK because the budget is not private. It's not sensitive. However, in proper, the budget is very much a private thing. The fact that your budget went down is because you participated in a query. And the reason you participated in a query tells you about you. So if you participated in that query just now, we know you're an adult. So if we can see your budget, we, we know something about you. We know a fact about you. So we have to accept that the budget cannot be private. That means we can't leak the budget. So what do we do? Well, the solution is that we, if an individual would run out of budget when we do a query, then we say, OK, in that table which would cause that individual privacy harm, we will remove all the records which depend on that individual. So we will remove them and silently drop them from the table. So that way we make sure that we don't include individuals whose privacy budget has been exhausted. But nevertheless, there may be a good number of individuals left. For example, on Tuesday, when you're analyzing the big population, you may have had to drop that small number of AB negative blood type individuals from your query. But in that particular case, there were lots left. So that's the approach uh, in the personalized differential privacy system that uh, we developed. But it's still maybe not completely obvious that this is privacy preserving. And there's a spoiler. Uh, uh, a first lesson is that 
Formal models are really good debugging tools. Okay? It can be very hard to find subtle bugs in systems, and sometimes they're not so subtle in hindsight, but you can't really get that hindsight unless sometimes you go the hard way around. So it turns out that, it turned out that I was right and Hamid was wrong. The system was, in fact, uh, broken, but fixable. So it was broken in the sense that if you think of the operation of dropping records from the table as a genuine transformation prior to performing an operation, you view it as a first class operation in the chain, then you see that the sensitivity of that operation is unbounded, which means we can't use it in combination with an epsilon query. Now, how do we fix that? Well, it turns out that the, the reason why it becomes unbounded is are the underlying problematic data transformation operators, such as the general join operation of a database. How many times does an individual get multiplied when you join two databases? Well, it depends on the size of the database you join it with. And so you can't bound it. So join is a typically problematic operation in a differentially private um, enforcement system. Now, we, we had hoped because we didn't need to think. <laughs> okay, so we, um, you'll have to explain that afterwards. Um, so don't worry, if I talk yesterday, no, I would chuckle. <coughs> so we had hoped that because our method was based on fine grained accounting, that you didn't have to place any constraints on the operators. And we thought that was cool because now we can do full joins and anything you like. It turns out we end up with the more or less the same constraints on the basic operations that, we, that Pink had in the first place. That's not to say we lose everything, but it wasn't quite as cool as we'd hoped. So how do we find these kind of bugs in systems that you might not spot at first? Well, I'm arguing that we need to model formally, and this is not a formal model. This is just a sort of schematic of the way we model the system. So what is the system? Well, the system kind of maintains a bunch of stuff, the implementation, the heart of the system, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that the programmer, the analyst, doesn't see. They only interact with this via a fixed API. And that API looks just like operations to apply differentially private primitive operations, update tables using SQL-like operations, and so on. Okay. So um, we're going to do some modeling here. So let me tell you a little bit about how we went about this. So firstly, how should we model a client program? This is, the, this is a potentially malicious, if you like, uh, analyst who is trying to break our system by applying queries in some way that we maybe didn't think of. Um, so what is a good model for this? Well, if you, if you look at Pink, you can say, well, uh, Pink really is a C, it's a C sharp program. So we should have a model of C sharp here. Well, that's probably A, unrealistic, but B, actually, you actually care about what programming languages you use in such a system because we are assuming that we have an unbreakable API here, okay? That there's no way to bypass this API and get raw access to the data. And many programming languages, it's actually impossible to do that. I mean, literally impossible. A good example would be, I think, Python. The whole philosophy of the Python programming language is that, I think they use the phrase, we're all consenting adults, which kind of means we don't need to give you any restrictions on what you do. And what that means is you can do all sorts of cool things, except prevent people from doing things, like bypassing an API and getting to the internals of some system. So it does matter what program you use. We couldn't model C sharp, even if it was a feasible thing to do. Um, what about an idealized program? So this is something you see in programming language research a lot. You take an idealized programming language, uh, a simply typed lambda calculus, or a, a while language uh, if you're doing something like Hall logic. Or... So an idealized program, and I see this a lot in works modeling information flow properties of systems. You take an idealized language. But there's something important about this, and that is that the syntax 
in here is not relevant other than the fact that it speaks the language of the API. There's nothing about the syntax which is important because we're not implementing a type system. We're not having to analyze the syntax in order to build a semantic model of the program. The only thing we care about is the fact that we are doing a certain sequence of a API calls. So this, in some sense, would be um, building in certain invariants about the way we use an API, which have no real relevance to the problem. So that doesn't seem really a good idea either. That's, that's in some sense, unnecessary simplification. All right, so what do we do that's in between? How about just abstracting this by a sequence of API calls? After all, the API is all that matters, right? Okay, let me give you some cautionary tales from, from uh, studying information flow. Uh, and it goes back a long way. In fact, if you trace it back, it goes back to a paper of Shannon in 58, um, where he was viewing this as a good thing. Hey, look, guys, we can transform, transfer more information. You know, that's, that's great. Uh, in the security context, that's usually not so great. Um, so this um, has been studied by a number of people. I think independently, uh, Whitbold and Johnston um, spotted this, uh, this behavior. So let's imagine a system here trying to simplify a little bit which has some component, some trusted component, a bit like this, where you think of this as the way we're modeling the client program here. And we have some system here, and some secret's gonna come in the top, and something which we hope is not a secret coming out the bottom. And there's some interaction between the two. So now let's instantiate P with the following little program. So P generates a uniformly distributed bit, flips a coin, which we're gonna call a key. And we assume that H can see this key, but outputs it to H. And now it's going to input something which we presume is some sort of secret, because it could be depending on this guy. And what it does is output the key XORed with the, the bit that it was, I'm assuming this is a bit as well, okay? So I've generated a one-time pad and I've encrypted the data that I'm sending out. So it doesn't really matter, you could argue here, it doesn't really matter what you receive from H. What I'm sending out is noise, okay? Pure noise. So if we model the behavior of H as a sequence of outputs, this system is zero differentially private. In other words, it has no information flow. It's non-interfering with regard to the input at the top, okay? That's what happens if you model H as a sequence. <coughs> However, if instead you model H as a program, then something else happens. Here's the program. H is gonna input the secret from the outside and it's going to grab the key that this guy generated, and then it's going to pass the key XORed with the secret to P. So what happens now when we run this program? Well, this encrypts the data here, but the thing that it's encrypted is H XORed with the key. In other words, this is a decryption of the secret. So what was the difference between those two models of the system? In one model, we viewed, we abstracted the behavior of a component of the system as a stream of values. But when we replace the model of us as a stream with a model as an active process, as a strategy, if you will, then, the, then we see that this is not a safe system from the security point of view. So it really matters how you do this kind of modeling. Okay. Now I can give very quickly, there's, uh, I have an example of this that arose in my own work and it relates to privacy. I'm, I know I'm running a bit short in time, but I think this is quite cute. Uh, well, I didn't think it was that cute at the time I discovered it, but anyway. Um, so we were modeling a notion of information erasure. So information erasure is this idea that, and I think it's embodied in, 
in some European uh, some parts of the GDPR legislation is that you know, once you've used the information for the purpose which you gathered it, then you should erase it. That's, that's roughly the idea. So we were asking the question, what does that mean, A, from a, from a semantic point of view, and B, how do we enforce it? And in this particular case, we're interested in enforcing using type systems. But in order to enforce it, we need to know what we're enforcing. What is a semantic model of information erasure? So here's a little example. I have a credit card transaction going on in this bit of code, a timeline running down from top to bottom. I receive a credit card. That's the, the interesting data that is subject to an erasure policy. The erasure policy is, when the transaction is complete, you should erase the data. And what erasing the data means, from our point of view, is not just that you syntactically delete the, 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 these digits from some place in memory, but any influence of those digits on anything else which is observable later on in the, event, in the interaction of the system. Okay. However, during the time when it has access to the credit card, it may indeed communicate it to the bank uh, and so on. Okay. So we studied how to specify this and how to enforce this. That's great. But our model of the outside world was not explicit. It was implicit. And by being implicit, effectively what we ended up doing was making the same mistake. We were modeling the outside world as a passive stream of inputs and outputs. So here's what can go wrong. When you initiate your transaction, uh, maybe a cookie is set in your machine, or maybe you can think of you get a special offer code. Thanks for shopping with us. Here's your special offer. Uh, next time you come back, we'll give you a 25% discount. And then indeed later on, you can use your 25% discount to uh, get a reduced purchase on your next interaction. However, this thing here could be just an encryption of your credit card number. So what you've done is that by using a clever strategy out here, information has escaped the system, this time not by malicious, it's not by a malicious user. The user is not malicious in storing a cookie and retrieving that cookie. But what they're doing is acting on behalf of the attacker to save the data which was supposed to be erased outside of the system and reintroduce it again. OK, let me get back to the main thread. How should then, should we model a client program? Well, I would argue that without further evidence that it's safe to do something simpler, we must model this as an active program in some form. However, we shouldn't model it as a particular program in a particular toy language because the language is not important in a dynamic enforcement system. So what we did, in fact, was model it as an arbitrary transition system in which the states of the system are completely abstract. We say, we don't know what the states are. We don't know what the programming language is, what its memory model is, anything. We have states, and it interacts with the outside world. However, by modeling in that way, we model the possibility that it interacts in a way which allows us to cover these cases of the cunning active adversary. And so that means that correct, a correctness proof for this system must quantify over all possible such programs which run here without having to detail them. And in, fee, in fact, that's not too difficult to do. OK, so if I'm going to extract a lesson from this, uh, abstractly make attacker models as simple as possible, but, but no simpler. Uh, that doesn't sound very, uh, very good. But at least I would say don't needlessly over-specify. In particular, dynamic enforcement mechanisms such as reference monitors in general are not about languages, they're about interfaces. OK, um, one other comment that I'd like to mention is, you know, it's very tempting in a system like this. It's an interactive system, outputs are generated sort of one after the other over time. It's very tempting to say, OK, we're going to do something like differential privacy for this system. But we'll kind of tweak it to fit the fact that we're not doing just a simple function with inputs and outputs. 
And you can do that, and it's tempting to do that, but you never quite know what you've got. I mean, lots of people have studied differential privacy for a, one or two definitions. You start introducing definitions which are little tweaks and variants of this. That's not the same as a generalization. Um, it's really not so convincing anymore what you've actually done. So I think it's a really good idea to sort of do a best effort to reduce the, model, the, the reasoning about the model to the standard case rather than modify the standard case to some case that fits the model. And how, how did we do that in this particular case? Well, what's tricky here is that we don't have a single output. We have many outputs. And in fact, we could have infinitely many outputs. We happen to have outputs which are zero differentially private. We will never exhaust any budgets. Um, and we might go on forever. So how do we talk about regular differential privacy in this context? Well, the way that we did this was to view each prefix of the output stream, which corresponds to an observer, or an attacker, if you will, who's observing the system for a particular duration of time. So once I chose, I've chosen how long I'm going to observe the system for, then I get a prefix of this potentially infinite trace. And what we can do is we can model the system as a probabilistic process that that output, of course, will be subject to various coin flips along the way, so that, that there will be a probability associated to that output. And what is that probability? It's the probability of observing that output among all outputs of the same length. In other words, once, you, once I've chosen, chosen to observe three outputs, then there will be a probability distributions of prefixes of the output traces projected down to those of length three. And by doing that, what we have is a family of functions indexed by the length of observation you make of the system. And what we're showing is that for each member of that family of functions, they satisfy regular, ordinary epsilon differential privacy. OK. So the ideas that we developed along the way to proving properties about this not obviously correct, in fact, not correct when we started, system, we've taken those lessons and distilled them into something somewhat simpler, um, basically revisiting the pink system, which is a, a real system, and building a little model of it, in some ways the most lightweight model we could think of, which was arguably faithful to the original design, that I think um, that we would like to offer as a useful starting point for modeling extensions and variants of these kind of dynamic differential privacy systems. Um, so let me wrap up in my last few minutes. Conclusions. Well, I've, I've shown you a few um, bumps along the way in, in formalizing, but what I hope to have convey to you is that, that there, is, there is value in building rigorous models of not just the core components and the basic principles you use to put them together, but a bit more top down, the system as a whole and how, they, how that can be decomposed into its pieces. Um, uh, and so uh, making a tackle models as simple as possible, but you've got to be careful. Um, don't over-specify where you don't need to because you're proving weaker properties in that case. I don't know why there's a number on that lesson. Um, and uh, if you can, reduce to the standard case rather than adapting the standard case to your situation. Uh, and then the final conclusion, as I say, I think formal models, have, for me, have been very good debugging tools. One can go a step further and making them both formal and machine checked, uh, and that's the general trend in, in the uh, programming languages community. Um, uh, but I think even without full mechanical proof, um, building formal models of your design uh, is a very useful thing. And I uh, thoroughly recommend it. And they even pay me for it. So it's awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Uh, so I want to just understand this. Uh, Trace concept a little, little better. It, it, it sound. It seems 
kind of similar in spirit to what in the, in the crypto world we've called the view of an adversary interacting with the system, uh, of whatever randomness they started with, and then the, the you know, uh, their entire view of the interaction with, uh, with the interactive system. And there, there we wouldn't typically, we, we talk, you know, we can talk about a system uh, indistinguishability with respect to uh, an adversary interacting with system in terms of in terms of the views being, you know, having similar distribution under two two different inputs or two different neighboring databases, and there we wouldn't typically restrict the 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 length of the interaction. We would just say it's a probability distribution on 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 uh, you know strings of unbounded length, right? uh, and uh, ask that for every set of possible strings the Probabilities are close, so I'm, I'm just yeah, so want to make sure I see what I'm um, yeah, missing so, in, in that. So we, what, what we could have done here is is even yeah. So you'd have to model this as unbounded or infinite. Um, so that's that's the domain, and you could associate a probability distribution with each of those complete things. Um, I guess what the, I would be concerned about then is okay, but what if I'm not willing to sit and watch this infinite output uh, or ar arbitrarily long? What if I just see some of it and decide to stop the system. Um, and indeed, if you look at the interaction between the inputs and the outputs, in fact, I think there are information leaks that you could hide if you ignored the fact that this, this trace has a kind of causal structure that relates to the inputs. That there is more structure in understanding the partial, the, all the partial things together than there is when you just look at the limit. But, but is not that at halting part of the strategy of the of the client program that could you universally quantify over those? Um, no, it's so I think there's two different parts of this: the client program and then the observer, which you kind of think of as separately. But the observer is maybe the one that can press control C, uh, which is outside of the program. Um, I, I mean, I think there are some subtleties there. It could be that you can, you can argue that it's enough to think of the distribution of the whole output space in one go. But from the point of view of proving, it was very convenient to do it this way because it gives us a kind of um, inductive handle uh, on things. And, and the, you know, the proofs here, not like typical crypto proofs. I mean, it's just doing induction over definitions of the way the computation of the system proceeds. Right, right. What I'm imagining is maybe like with epsilon delta differential privacy, this uh, truncation could yeah, cause so problems. the epsilon delta case is the one that causes the issue. Like, when you're doing epsilon and different privacy, you can just, like, you can do the proof for every possible sequence, and then just the proof composer. Wow. Well, you... Well, Sorry? yeah, so, the thing about epsilon delta is that, um, I mean, what you don't see clearly in the definition, when you look at the rarefied definitions, what you don't see is the subtleties in the, um, in the adaptiveness properties. So, so I, I, I don't want to go to RDP, RDP is better. So, so RDP can, you can show adaptive composition under RDP, but when you do RDP proofs, you have to look at the entire sort of tree of possible sequences you can get. Um, and then do the analysis. You can't do it like each individual trace. Uh, and I think in the crypto literature, you do have negligible probability, and maybe that's why you need to look at the entire view and not just look at the individual trace. So that could be the connection with the crypto literature. But I agree with you, it's not, it's not, yeah, that's not the And I think you, you, you realize it much more clearly when you build a system model because you cannot avoid the, it's not just adaptivity in the way that people often assume, oh, adaptivity, that's just where the results of one query can be used to determine the next query. Yeah. But often people are assuming that the next query, the epsilon is already fixed. Yes. And what you find is that in a, in when you implement, when you model it the way it really is, you suddenly realize, actually, that they, I, I, you wouldn't be able to use that as in, in the proof because the epsilon's not is adaptive as well. And that's very easy to miss when you're doing just focusing on sort of abstracting out the high-level principles. You might not have quite general enough principles f for the system at hand. Going the other way, modeling the system directly, you have no choice. And you're going to hit that. You'll see uh, Murphy's Law tells you it'll be the last proof case where you'll find it. But uh, that's the way things are. There is another question that's oh. I have another question. <laughs>
I, I, if we have time, otherwise I'll take it offline. I, it, it was kind of coming a, back to John's question uh, a little yeah, bit. So. We have a bit of time. We started a few minutes later. So this is going back to the personalized aspect? Yep. yep. So the, when you mentioned that, the, that, that uh, inside the, the system, the, the personalized budgets then become sensitive, sensitive yeah. themselves. So that's kind of su suggesting a, that the definition is saying something like a, a person's data is their is their their data record and their epsilon. And when you when you add someone or remove someone from a data set, you're adding a, a, a data item and an epsilon. And with an epsilon kind of is that the definition you're working with or something? Well, different? you know that that sounds like a, an elegant way to handle it. And maybe if we'd thought about it that way from the beginning, we might have defined it that way. But we do keep them separate. We kind of view the epsilon as coming from this you know global um, platonic. A sort of map between records and uh, and budgets. So we kind of push that outside of the system. So can you say a word about how you handle the the, the worry that you you described? Uh, I mean, it, just saying that you have to get rid of joins wasn't like enough for me to get a sense. Yeah. Okay. So so but basically by getting rid of so so you restrict to a certain class of uh, of operations on the data which have a sort of join preser uh, union preserving property over the, the, the sets of data, the, the records, the sets of records. Um, and that condition is enough to guarantee that the sensitivity of the, the number of records which you delete is, is relatively low. So the sensitivity of the, of the deletion operation that takes place before the query is low. So that's. Thanks. Yeah, just just to clarify, is the only reason why you need to keep the individual privacy budget uh, private because of the fact that change in that inherently reveals whether you've contributed to a yeah, previous query? There's indeed. No other no. issue? Uh, well, so, so it could be. If you wanted to, if you like the idea that somebody should have a personalized, that you should be able to set your own personal budget on your data, then we could plug that in to the system and start where everybody has their own real personal uh, uh, budget. But if you did that, it's probably the case that you would like to keep it secret. Because the fact that you view your data as much more sensitive uh, than I do maybe makes you a sort of target. You know, why, why, are, your medical, why are you making your medical records so secret? Uh, you know, maybe we should erase your insurance. Uh, so in that case, the fact that the, we treat it as if it was sensitive from the beginning, even though we don't need to at the very beginning, could be used for, for, for really setting a personalized sensitive budget. All right. Uh, maybe we can take this offline. Sorry. I think uh, we, it's better we keep on schedule uh, because there are also people that are watching the live stream. Uh, and it's uh, good to keep to the schedule. Let's Thanks. make uh, the vacation.